Okay. The P is an odd prime. W is a quadratic residue. Mod P, if there exists a U such that U squared is congruent to <coughs> W mod P. Okay. The quadratic residues are the things that have square roots. But the things that are left behind is residues mod P after you square something. We normally exclude the case of zero mod P. Remember, zero isn't present in the multiplicative group mod P. Really, really the setting for this is the multiplicative group mod P. Zero isn't interesting in a multiplicative way. It just kills everything when you multiply it. Anything by zero. Okay. And it's a non residue. A quadratic non residue mod P if there does not exist a U such that U squared is common to W. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, for every possible U you might try, U squared is never congruent to W. Okay. So residue and non residue. And we've already proved one significant thing, right? <coughs> Remember how many things are in ZP? How many things are in the multiplicative group modulo P? Is P minus one. P is an odd prime number. P minus one is an even number. We've already proved that it splits exactly half and half. Okay? ZP, half the elements so what that means is p minus 1 over 2 are residues. And so by definition, and half not non-residues. Okay, we proved that yesterday morning. That was fairly direct proof. We proved that if you, if you take the first half of elements, 1, 2, 3, up as far as p minus 1 over 2, First half of the common classes square them, they give you values which are obviously quadratic residues because they've come from the squares. And there weren't any more because if you take any of the other elements in ZP, any other element in ZP is the negative of one of the elements from the first half. And so when you square a thing and square its negative, you get the same value. So there weren't any more quadratic residues just the ones you get by squaring the first half of elements. One squared, two squared, up as far as the square of P minus one over two. The last, so, so that looks like there's P minus one over two elements. The last part of the proof was proving that all of those were distinct. And it wasn't the case that if you took two things from the first half, squared them, that you could get the same value. You proved Taking the first half of elements, 1 to p minus 1 over 2, when you square them, all the values are different congruence classes. So that proved, that proved this result that we're remembering now. And we started proving, so that was one significant thing. The second significant thing we almost finished was the structural, structural multiplicative properties. And these were very much inspired from thinking of square roots in the regular arithmetic, regular arithmetic with real numbers, right? We know the criterion for when things have square roots or not in the real numbers. Positive things have square roots, negative things don't. And there's this structural property of multiplication that positive by positive gives positive, negative by positive gives negative, negative by negative gives a positive number again. Everybody's familiar with that. You've been familiar with that for a long, long time. So here's a new setting. We've got number-like objects, these congruence classes. We've got a multiplication-like operation. It's defined in terms of multiplication, multiplication of the congruence classes. And now we've stumbled upon this notion of having a square root, being a residue, or not, being a non-residue. 
And we've identified that half of them are residues, half of them aren't. So that immediately prompted that thing, ah, is there the same structural, you know, structure under multiplication? Could we reasonably say that the residues are acting like positive numbers and the non-residues are acting like negative numbers in that sense? We don't have the notion of bigger than or less than zero in this setting. So we don't have exactly the, no the positive notion of the negative notion, but maybe there's this very much connected notion. So which was residue times a residue gave a residue. We proved that yesterday. We proved that non-residue times a residue always gave a non-residue. We proved that yesterday as well by proof by contradiction. But we didn't get to the third one. I left it as a left it as an exercise. So we'll prove that now. But still to prove is a non-residue multiplied by a non-residue equals a residue. So here's the here's the proof of this. <coughs> so, well, we want to prove something about a non-residue times a non-residue. Okay, so we better let u and v be non-residues, non-residues modular p. And we want to think about their product u times v. Um, but we're going to make use of the things we've already proved. So I'm going to let R1, R2, up as far as R, P minus 1 over 2, be the residues. And we know half of the elements are residues. So here they are. Like, We've already proved that u multiplied by each of these is what? u is a non-residue. These are all the residues. We've already proved that non-residue times residue gave a non-residue. Okay. That's true for i equals 1 to p minus 1 over 2. So now it suddenly looks like we're looking at p minus 1 over 2 non-residues. Are they all distinct? Are they all actually different? Well, yeah. They're all distinct because for if u r u r i was congruent to u r j mod p, what would that imply? R i was congruent to r j. Yeah, you can cancel the u. You can multiply both sides by u inverse. So, you know, obviously these objects are elements of ZP, the multiplicative group set. But but I started off by listing, I said, I mean, maybe we have to explicitly say these be all the residues. So the, none of these are duplicates. They are all the residues. So so that can't happen. So a contradiction if contradiction if i is not equal to j. So here's our two non-residues uv. We've already proved that when you multiply u by a residue, you get a non-residue. But more importantly, you use up all the non-residues. Because look, here it are. Here's a non-residue, and how many of them are there? <coughs> the options for i, this p minus 1 over 2. 
So what else can u times v be? What does it have to be? It has to be a residue. We, in forming the products u times ri, we've used up all the non-residues. So if we look at a new product, u times a v, where v is a non-residue, v is not any of these, not congruent to any of those, the new element we're slipping in, it has to be a different element from any of these. And these are all the non-residues, we've used them all up, so u times v has to be a residue again. Residue has all the non-residues are already accounted for. As the products u times r by. This is an example of a count, a very straightforward enough accounting argument, okay? where you can prove things, prove statements just based on a careful counting. We know in ZP, the multiplicative group ZP does P minus one elements. Here's half of them we've generated, the non-residues. So when we look at a new product, U times something else has to be a different element, so it's forced to be one of the other half, forced to be a residue. Okay. So that's the that's the that's the completion of that proof. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. Our residues and non-residues do have the same structural pattern as the positives and negatives have in the real number set. Okay. So that's a very it establishes quite a strong connection, quite a good way of thinking. A good connection between square roots and the quadratic things going on in the ZP, the group of congruence classes under multiplication, and the quadratic and squaring things going on in the real numbers. Okay, I won't do too much else, but I will introduce a new piece of uh, piece of note notation. Okay. So, an important general problem where is its head? All right, given n. Given odd prime p, <laughs> and an n being an element of the multiplicative group, i.e. p does not divide n, is n a residue? That's the general problem. Now we can easily discover the answer at the moment in a fairly naive way. Incorrect about it, but it's a little bit naive. So we could square everything. Well, we don't have to square everything, but we have to square the first half of the elements to discover all the quadratic residues. Those are all the quadratic residues. And then ask yourself the question, are any of them congruent to n mod p? Either one of them will be congruent to n, in which case n is a quadratic residue, or none of them will be congruent to n, in which case n is a quadratic non-residue. Now, why do I denigrate that technique by calling it naive? Well, it's just a, it's just a brute force method. Okay? It, it, it answers the question, is n a residue, by doing a whole lot of work to calculate all the residues and then look for n in that list. Okay? And also the problem is, so this is a lot of work, meaning 
you know, if P is large. If we're talking about large primes, we have to troll through half of the elements and work out, square them all, and work out all of the residues. So it's a lot of work. The second part about it is we're not, it's not very intelligent. We're not making use of any deeper properties of quadratic residues. We're not going to discover much, you know, all we can do is just look out for patterns and stuff. So it's, 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 um, you know, we're not making use of any further structure or further properties of quadratic quadratic residues that there might be to discover. So it's not very sophisticated. And we want to be sophisticated, of course. So in general, we, we're, we're setting ourselves the task of finding better methods for this. We want to gain some more understanding about the nature of quadratic residues and find more techniques. Okay. So we'll introduce some new notation. This notation is partly just to save ourselves saying and writing n is a quadratic residue mod p all the time. It's a bit of a mouthful in saying it and writing it. We just want to maybe, it is one of the cases where we want to introduce some new symbols just to shorten it and try and get into a more calculating mindset. So this is, the definition is the Legendre symbol. The Legendre symbol. This is a two-place symbol. It's like a function. Okay, N, N, P. Its definition is it's like an indicator function. It's a function that takes one of three values, one minus one, zero. We're going to say it takes the value zero in the case where P divides N. Uh, it's a little bit tricky here. We're using the straight line in multiple places to <coughs> note different things, but it's not my choice. It's, it's the way the notation has evolved and um, the practice that's developed. Well, you know, it's just like <laughs> English. It's the same letter is pronounced differently depending yeah. on which word it occurs in. I mean, <laughs> this is the nature of evolved human systems. Um, we say it's equal to plus one if n is a residue mod p, quadratic residue mod p, a minus one if n is a non-residue mod p. Okay. We've given ourselves an indicator function. Other books write it, other books write it as that kind of thing, fraction n over p. The way we're, we're choosing to write it, it's potential confusion with the divisibility symbol, which does not have brackets around it. That's saying p divides n, n is a multiple of p. This is the Legendre symbol, so it's got a pair of brackets around it. <laughs> and you got a p a prime number in the second place, okay? Other books write it like this, but that is potential source of confusion as well. Because you, your mind starts thinking it's fractions and believing in fractions, and stuff, okay? So that's also potentially confusing, okay? Okay, but that's what it is, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat>
So yeah, it is potentially confusing, but that's life. <laughs> I mean, it's really universal, this kind of stuff. Like we drive on the left-hand side of the road, but next door, France, they drive on the right. I mean, you think we would have agreed to make it the same, but no, just, there's no, so in this place, this symbol means one thing, in this place, it means another thing. Just can't get around it. Okay, but this is a device, so our general question now, it becomes somewhat more, somewhat, it feels a little bit more like a traditional mathematical problem. We need techniques for evaluating NP. Yeah, for evaluating NP. We won't do too much more, we'll, we'll just, but I want to get you to a, a tantalizing point where we start to see that even just bringing in a silly notation can suddenly open a door and make things seem a little bit more doable or a little bit more achievable, okay? We've already proved, so this is good, we've already proved something. Finished it today. We started it yesterday. We've already proved theorem. There's a different proof given in the notes, perhaps not as enlightening a proof. Theorem 8.3. The Legendre symbol is multiplicative. We would say in the traditional mathematical sense, but because we're in number theory, we have to say completely multiplicative. You should know what that means. What, what does that mean? Well, maybe. It means if you evaluate it on a product, what is it equal to? Yeah. The product of the the product of the individual Legendre symbols is equal to the Legendre symbol of n mod p times the Legendre symbol of n mod p. It's a multiplic. When you think of it as a function of a single, when you when p p is fixed, and you think of it as a function of the first argument, the first entry, it's a multiplicative function, just like your favorite multiplicative function, which is maybe the determinant. Determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Classic, interesting, multiplicative function. We've already proved this. This was essentially our structural multiplicative property. That residue times residue is residue. So that means if this is plus one and this is plus one, they're both residues, then this has to be plus one. We proved residue times non-residue was non-residue. Residue would have plus one, non-residue would have minus one, so that product is minus one, and it will be equal to this, because this will be minus one as well if one is a residue and the other one isn't. And thirdly, non-residue times non-residue, that means these are both minus one, but we've proved it has to be a residue, so this is plus one. So again, it agrees. Okay. So we've already proved this in our work on the structural properties of um, the multiplication of residues and non-residues. We've already proved this in our work with residue times residue, etc. Okay, we've already proved that. Okay, maybe you know, another little details is in the zero case. What if one of them was divisible by p? A few extra details, but it's, it's not really interesting. Normally, we don't evaluate it at multiples of p. Just interested in elements from the multiplicative group. So, okay. Think of a general integer n. How will I evaluate n mod p? 
how can I think of it? How can I break this down? Right. If I know it's multiplicative, remember we're in the number theory class. What important concept have we introduced for thinking about integers in a general way? What one famous result have we proved about integers? It had a grand name. <coughs> What's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic say? Every integer, every integer can be factored into primes. So this general n is really, we think of it, we gain insights into the n by thinking of it in terms of its prime factorization. Okay. So that's the prime factorization of n. How does that help me think about the general problem of evaluating that? Figuring out whether n is, because if I can evaluate this and discover whether it's plus one or minus one, I'll know whether n is a residue. Right? That's, that's the same question. This is what, it's another example of stepping, like the theme in the coursework, stepping from basic principles and running with them, squeezing them, getting generalized. If we know that the Legendre symbol is multiplicative in this simple way, and you've got a factor of two things, this Legendre symbol factorizes as the product of the two Legendre symbols. Well, this is just a big old product of a load of things, yeah? That's a product of two things, this is a product of a load of things. But if it works for products of two things, <laughs> I hope you can see it should work for products of more than you just keep applying this basic multiplicative property and you can factorize the whole symbol. You can take the product operation outside, you can take the exponentiation operation outside, because exponentiation is just repeated multiplication. Okay. So the general problem of answering whether something is a quadratic residue seems to boil down to the general problem of understanding when, because these are special numbers here, these are primes, the i, understanding whether one prime is a quadratic residue modulo another one. If we have techniques that can answer that question, but the one prime is a quadratic residue modulo another one, <coughs> then via the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we should in principle, as long as we can compute the products of factorizations, but we've got a theoretical understanding that we'll be able to understand that question. We can evaluate any Legendre symbol once we know how to evaluate Legendre symbols of one prime modulo another one. So, the general evaluation of NP depends on our ability to compute factorizations and products for N. Depends on depends on that, but crucially, depends on evaluating QP for primes P and Q. So that's nice. Suddenly, just, and it almost happened by accident, just by introducing the notation, suddenly falls out that the general problem reduces to just understanding the behavior on primes. So that's extremely nice. And that, that, that's an example of what we mean when we say that, you know, 
the primes are the key to the integers, or the primes hold the secrets of the integers, or that kind of talk. The primes are made, the integers are made of the primes in the multiplicative sense. Okay. So this becomes the general uh, task, and this will lead to culmination of the unit and our most advanced result, most, our most sophisticated result, which is the quadratic reciprocity law. The law of quadratic reciprocity. Reciprocity is like me to you and you to me, this kind of reciprocal back and forward thing. The quadratic reciprocity law, it doesn't quite answer the question, what's the value of QP? But it relates PQ to QP. And it will allow us, it will allow us to develop an algorithm for answering this, this kind of question. To evaluate a general Legendre symbol. You don't even have to be able to evaluate, well, we do also. But allowing this flipping, understanding how the quadratic residue status of P modulo Q relates to the residue status of Q modulo P, that would be a crucial piece of understanding that will lead to an algorithmic answer to evaluating the general genre. Was John talking about evaluating the genre symbols? Um, he was talking about the quadratic residues for like two seconds towards at the end. Okay. Yeah, he mentioned okay. an algorithm that you did a project on. Could be that. There was a, wasn't there Paul Roller? I don't, I don't know, I was doing a project. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he, he was Yeah, he was referring to something else. But uh, Well, in, <laughs> related. He was referring to a mapping amongst uh, the quadratic residues and stuff. Yeah. But, um, no, but here, here is something we're going to capture in this course. Uh, it's, it's kind of reminiscent of the Euclidean algorithm, but it's some kind of implementable algorithm that will evaluate our Legendre symbol. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction, a look ahead at, at the rest of the chapter, okay? So we'll continue with that. Um,